Almost 70 years ago, these men were boys just out of school. In one fell swoop, you ceased being a boy and you became a man. So young to be caught up in the world's darkest hour, the last year of the Second World War. Now in old age, these precious few survivors are all around us, hidden in plain view. This is the last chance to hear what really happened firsthand. German bodies, Canadian bodies, British bodies. The smell, the stench. That's war. That's war. From the landings on the D-Day beaches, to fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in a freezing winter, and storming through Europe uncovering the true horrors of Nazi Germany. How can human people do that to other human people? How can they do it? It's their story in their words, not the one written by generals and historians. After all these years, still no metal. Where there's original film, we'll see where they fought. Where archive doesn't exist, we'll use real bombs and weapons to illustrate what our veterans went through. This is the story of the final year of World War II in Europe, as told by the last war heroes. After the beaches of D-Day, came the countryside of Normandy. It was rough because they could see us, we couldn't see them. I would say it was the worst combat that I've ever been in because we lost so many men. You go from one hedgerow to another and the Germans were behind each one of them. Now, assistant platoon leader, Lieutenant Irwin, got up to look through a hole in the hedgerow in front of him when the German gun was aimed right at him. Shot him right through the head. Just hours earlier on the D-Day beaches, these men had already endured constant fire from pillboxes, shelling, and underwater mines. They'd seen countless friends die. They were now entering a new phase of the battle. The Allied troops had been given orders by General Montgomery to race through Normandy and seize the city of Caen. The Germans were dug in, hidden by a maze of high hedges, fields and sunken roads known locally as the Bocage. To reach Caen, the Allies would have to advance through what looked like beautiful countryside. In reality, it was more like jungle warfare. Amazingly, no one thought this terrain would be difficult. Armoured divisions who'd been victorious in the flat deserts of North Africa were sent forward.
In his reconnaissance vehicle, 23-year-old Ron Titterton was part of the advance. It was the worst country in the world to fight in. We was used to open warfare in the desert. And to leave the desert, to come to fight in country, like the Bacards was, was, you know, to us, it was suicidal. Not far from the beaches, 18-year-old Frank Rosier, an apprentice draftsman, was slogging his way on foot. We got further inland, and suddenly over the top of us, the Germans were shelling us. I hit the deck, and the bloke walking near me must have taken a direct hit because his hands landed in front of me. As I hit the deck, a hand landed with me, a whole arm like that landed with me, and I screamed my head off. But that explains because the shell burst, the explosion goes up. So the safest place is to lay on the ground. The fields were now scattered with young men fighting for the first time in their lives. Among them, 23-year-old miner's son, Bill Evans. I didn't want to go to the army. <laughs> My mother wouldn't let us join the scouts because it was uh, regimental. She didn't like the idea. <laughs> In June 1943, along with other young men from his village in South Wales. Bill was finally conscripted. I was 31 Evans. My friend, he was 36 Jones. Why? <laughs> There's so many Joneses in the Welsh Regiment, right? There's so many Evanses. There's so many Griffiths, right? That when the mail comes, or if an officer or a sergeant wants you, Instead of saying Evans or Griffiths, <laughs> there's so many, yes, sir. <laughs> Seven hands go up, ten hands go up with the Joneses. Ninety-seven year old Bill Doyle was then a newly married 29-year-old platoon sergeant. Not far from Omaha Beach, Bill was now bogged down in the bocage under heavy fire. We had to take those hedgerows, and the Germans were firing across that field. We were over there for three days, just running from one hedgerow to another, and uh, uh, frankly, I didn't know where we were half the time. You could hear the bullets when they would come through and hit the side of the hedgerow. And then the Germans hit those grenades over top. scared the whole time I was in there. There's three companies over there, almost 600 men. 110 of us came back from that mission. Despite the heavy stream of casualties, troops were ordered to advance village by village. Bill Evans and the South Wales borderers were sent through an area of woodland. We were 
going up the road and there was an 88 millimeter firing straight down the lowest trajectory. And he was coming into the trees and the branches and the trees are coming down. I have no time to dive. And then 36 Jones over the other side of the road. And, oh, and he's screaming. Screaming his head off. And they were still firing in the trees above me. As the German shells exploded, the trees themselves became weapons, shattering deadly splinters in all directions. Jones was screaming, and he got this tree shrapnel in the face. All I could see was his cheek, cheekbone here, and this blood was pumping out. Oh, good God. And I got my field dress in, and I, I wound it round his face about three times when this officer yelled out, you know, Evans, leave him for the stretcher burners. Come on, come on. It was get, for, get forward, never mind about this. Leave him for the stretcher burners. Come on. And I left him there, and I didn't know until I don't know what it, year it was. Not many years ago that I found out that 36 Jones died. <sighs> Bled to death. Bill and 36 Jones left the same Welsh village for France. Frederick James Jones died in the fields of Normandy, aged just 19. I went all sick, and then and, uh, feeling guilty, I suppose, that I, I, I wasn't clever enough to, to, uh, to uh, what I did was no help to him, you know. Um, not so much blaming myself, but. Uh, um, um, a sort of feeling that uh, I wished I could have drawn, done more for him, you know. The plan to take the city of Caen in a day had failed. The generals now ordered the armoured divisions to attack the Germans head on. Nineteen-year-old Harold Curry left school in Liverpool to join his heroes, the Desert Rats. And now he was in one of their tanks, charging across the Normandy countryside. There was a wonderful feeling. At that age, you see, it's all exciting. It's not, I didn't feel a sense of fear. But then suddenly, there'll be explosions going on. It was devastating because you go forward in your tank with, in line with other tanks, then you might find a tank on your right being blown up, another one on your left being blown up, and that's, that's for sheer luck whether you, you're going to the next one or not. Harold and the other crews were beginning to realise just how vulnerable their tanks actually were. When up against one of Germany's most destructive weapons, the Tiger tank. It was an ever-present fear. 
I mean, the word tiger is enough. The Tiger's 88mm gun had such a long range, it could pick off the approaching Allied tanks before their crews realised they were targets. Former bus company clerk, 20-year-old Peter Davies, was part of the force attacking the Germans head-on in his Sherman tank. We were crossing the road and we hit one of the big hedges and we were suddenly being fired off. Heavy shells were coming in close to us. One tank was knocked out and the five men killed. Another tank was hit and two men were killed. Second one hit us straight up the backside in at the engine, smashed the engine, the diesel was running and the shell landed by my leg. And it was still white hot when it came through the tank. The German shells could easily cut through a Sherman tank, igniting everything inside. We bailed out. We ran for cover. We hadn't even seen who was firing on us. Then a shell hit that petrol tank. We were knocked out in a matter of about 10 minutes before we'd got into any battle. I lost my first tank. Across the Normandy countryside, the Tiger was leaving a trail of burning Allied tanks. Nine times out of ten, when it was hit, it would brew up. In other words, it would go on fire. And that is horrendous. Many tank men were trapped inside alive. And very often, when you pull out uh, of action at night, you can see uh, the rest of your tanks that are left behind glowing bright red or sometimes even white. That's part of the horror of war. By now, Peter and the other tank crews lived in constant fear of attack. They were often sealed inside their six-foot square living space, which became dining room, kitchen and toilet for the five men inside. They are your family in a way because you've been looking at their ugly mugs for this last 12 months or three years. You know the fears, the worries, the problems that they have. You live together, eat together, sleep together, die together if necessary. In civilian life, 22-year-old Ian Hamilton had been a bank clerk. He was now a commander in charge of five tanks. Apart from the nagging fear, there was always hope that you weren't going to be a target. So at night, we found it wise to dig a hole about a foot or so deep, put the tank tarpaulin over it, run the tank over the top of it, and then put our blankets down there. So everybody was hunkered down underneath the tanks to get some protection. We could even listen to the BBC home service. The frontal assault was another failure. When military intelligence spotted a gap in German defences, General Montgomery sent tanks to sneak through it at a small town to the west of Caen. On the morning of the 13th of June, tanks rolled in to the picturesque town of Villa Bocage. Among them, the schoolboy who dreamt of being a tank commander, 
Harold Curry in his Cromwell tank. We came in, beautiful day. People came out of the streets uh, with flowers and cider and calvados. And we thought, this is great, no sign of any Germans. And we thought, this is going to be a wonderful day for us. In his tank, not far behind Harold, was former Cambridge University rower, 23-year-old Lieutenant John Cloudsley Thompson. I was rather busy looking at the map, trying to work out what was happening. And, and then, quite very suddenly, the, the tank in front of me burst into flames. I couldn't see anything. There was a lot of smoke, and 88 millimeter shot went so close to my ear that although I was wearing headphones, I was deaf for 24 hours afterwards. Harold and John hadn't realized they'd been spotted by the elite 101st Heavy Panzer Division. He'd been unloading their Tiger tanks at the railway station nearby. Their commander was this man, the feared Michael Wittmann, personally honored by Hitler with the country's highest medal, the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. He was famously credited with 137 tank kills. They did not expect us to be there. Now that we expect them to be coming into Villebacage. And we were surrounded by a whole division and we just had one regiment. Impossible odds. Tanks usually fight each other at a distance. But in Villa Bacage, we found ourselves engaging with German tanks, firing through buildings. And that was pretty horrifying. Explosions are taking place all over the town. You can see tanks being blown up, and then you think, well, it could be me next time, but then you have to dismiss that from your mind because that's the way life goes. And then through the smoke in front, I suddenly saw this huge tank coming along. John Cloudsley Thompson had no idea his tank was face to face with Michael Wittmann's Tiger. So I gave the orders to the gunner to fire to try and shoot the Tiger up. Bang! It went way over the Tiger tank. But it wouldn't have made any difference if we had shot it because. The, uh, the other, some of the other tanks did get shot at it, and they just bounced off. Didn't make any difference. The Allied guns simply weren't powerful enough to pierce the Tiger's armor. The German tanks were far better designed. I don't think that anybody who designed our tanks had ever been in a tank battle or even looked at it. I saw this tank come. It moved the. 88 millimeters, just like that, then wham, and the shot came. And uh, I was standing up within the turret looking through the periscope. I ducked down and I felt a tingling between my legs. I thought, well, lucky my legs were apart because I knew that the shot must have gone between and landed up in the engine. All I could see was the massive flame from the engine. So I said, bail out. Crew bailed out. My crew said, John, John, get down. So I, I got down behind the gooseberry bush, but it wasn't the place you could stop. You know, there was shooting going on all over the place. The tank behind mine was the adjutant's tank. 
tiger was firing back and shot him up with one shot and then went on into the town. We came in the morning, a beautiful town, no sign of any damage whatsoever. And when we left, there were tanks all over the town, buildings destroyed, bodies lined up in the square. Young men who had been alive that morning were dead. You just have to live with it. I thought all the people I knew were killed at Villers Bocage. There was one, the body of the, of the uh, driver was completely burnt away, but his legs and his hands were completely unburnt. So it looked so odd to see his legs and his hands perfectly normal. It's the only time in my life I've been really frightened. I think I was an adult. I was adult by the end of it, but in the beginning I wasn't. The city of Caen was supposed to be captured on D-Day. Three weeks into the invasion, it still hadn't fallen. After failing to take the Germans head on, the generals came up with a new plan. Surround the city. The Canadians, Americans and British moved in to encircle the German defenders. got to advance where they're defending. So we've got the worst shot. We've got to find them. The fighting moved from the hedgerows into the streets. Kitchens and living rooms of ordinary people's homes became the battleground Instead of fighting across fields, for Frank Rosier, the enemy was now behind every door. It was pretty scary. And the only way you were only going to find out where Jerry was, was to get him to shoot at you. And hope to God you found out where he was shooting from. That was tough. Infantrymen against infantrymen. You see something move, or do a fire, or do a wait, or that, and your hair stands up on the back of your head, because not even the birds sing. He had a habit of getting some French children around him, and uh, you burst in the room, you see the kids. And, uh, you know, you stop seeing the kids there. And the other thing was, so he gently went through the window and throw a grenade. The small pineapple shaped hand grenades used to clear out enemy trenches and bunkers were designed to be lethal inside confined spaces. Pretty hairy thing to do, sleep fighting. Out in the fields, 
Artillery units improvised with their anti-aircraft Bofors gun. They angled it down so they could fire it like a machine gun. A 17-year-old schoolboy who lied about his age to join up, Bombardier Bruce Melanson was now part of a Bofors gun crew. The Germans had a good way of trying to hide their troops, camouflaging with haystacks. The houses, like behind them would be houses, and haystacks would be planted all in front of them. And therefore, who the hell is going to fire at a haystack? What for? You don't want to kill the hay. The Beaufort then came in mighty handy. Because we would fire at those haystacks, which was really headed going right through the haystack into the house. Bang, 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 bang. 40 millimeter shell is powerful. Soon as it hit, there would be like an explosion. Splatter it. Open it up. And after a couple of those Bofors shells <laughs> were fired into there, let me tell you, a few hands would come up. Quite a few. And then we would use it for houses, apartments, churches, wherever the Germans were. Mighty, mighty powerful, mighty powerful gun nut, that Bofor gun. Not far from Bruce, the Canadians had overrun a German unit on the outskirts of Caen. 20-year-old rifleman Alex Adair, a farmhand from Ontario, was guarding the prisoners. Our commanding officer, Jock Sprague, he went around the company and he said, the Queen's Zone do not shoot prisoners. Well, we said, what the hell is he talking about? We're, we're not into shooting prisoners. Alex was shocked to discover who he'd been fighting. They were the elite 12th SS Panzer Division, fanatical Hitler youth with a reputation for killing prisoners. Jack Sprague already knew that they were shooting prisoners. He already knew that they'd killed some guys from D Company. The SS had taken them prisoner and then shot them. I'm still mad about it. I still feel that they, uh, they didn't fight fair. Many of the SS were just schoolboys, some as young as 13. Instead of tobacco in their pockets, they found the boys had been issued with sweets. Our fire officers, if they had gone around and said, we don't take prisoners anymore, we shoot them all, I would have felt it against my better judgment to do it, but I guess I would have done it. I, I'm not sure I would have, but I might have. The ground troops were still no nearer to capturing Caen. There was even a fear they'd be pushed back into the sea and the invasion of Europe abandoned. Then six weeks after D-Day, Allied commanders took a momentous decision. They came 
came in in the early morning, flying over the sea, it was the most impressive sight because they were all coming in exactly the same direction towards us. When our planes came over to bomb, they weren't very high, and we stood up and cheered. There were so many bombers that it was like a conveyor belt. The bigger bombers were 12 bombers wide in their formation. And as far as you could see from here directly overhead, for as far as I could see with my binoculars, just bombers. Over 2,000 bombers were sent to carpet bomb the city of Caen. I heard this sound, I looked up, and here comes our bombers. I thought, oh boy, give it to them. So I just took my helmet off and waved and I yelled, give it to them, boys. And the next thing I knew, I, the bombs, uh, doors opened and these things are shrieking down. <laughs> I headed for a little hole in the ground. I dove in there fast. started to drop and the dust and that started to come towards us. I said, gee, are, are those bombs coming towards us? And there's a Sherman tank right in front of me. I zoomed under the Sherman tank. God almighty. Saw the bombers coming over and feel the whole ground shake. Fire and terrible noise. Massive fire power. and dropped the bombs amongst us. They told us that the field we were in was exactly the same shape as the field further on that they were to drop. And that's what caused the mix-up. <laughs> I was so frightened. My hands went into the ground and here was a potato field. And I don't know how many peck of potatoes I ate, but by God, I was eating potatoes. I was so frightened, you know. I was really scared. On the ground, nowhere was safe. Surviving the bombing, just a matter of luck. We lost 60 men. I think the Canadians lost 600. One of the most intensive bombing campaigns in history was over. The once beautiful medieval city of Caen lay in ruins. In their final desperate attempt to take Caen, Allied generals had flattened it. They blew the place to all the wretched, pardon the expression. 
we got a front row seat to watch them bomb the, the city all to hell, and then they couldn't get the they couldn't get the armor through the streets. We always wondered why we'd bombed it so heavy, because when you bomb a place, it makes terrific hiding for infantry, and it makes your job worse and worse. If you turn a ghost house to house fighting, then rubble fighting. We weren't sophisticated enough to know that the bombing actually suited the Germans. It's easier to defend a ruined town than a normal town because the, the debris gives you marvellous cover. The Germans said, lovely. Monty said, should be captured on, on, on D-Day. Farm me. Advancing with his Bofors gun, Bruce Melanson clearly remembers the Germans' last-ditch attempt to keep them out. It was frightening. There was never a moment in Khan that you weren't in a, in a nervous state or heavy shallery, heavy artillery, heavy everything. It was a constant fight. It was such a battle and so many killed. It took Bruce and the rest of the ground forces two days of bitter fighting to finally take Caen. By the 20th of July 1944, the last of the German defenders had fled the city. Almost 70 years on, the memories aren't of victory and celebration. It was sad, to say the least. You knew there were people there. They killed more French people than they did Germans. To my way of thinking, it was totally unnecessary. that battle was nothing but seeing dead bodies, dead horses, dead cows. And as we were moving along with our trucks and our Bofor gun to try to get through, we would have to stop sometimes and move the bodies over so we could get through. And then the bodies would be picked up by the, by the uh, medical people, you know afterwards, and the smell, the stench. That was the Battle of Khan. That's what you experienced, that's what you've seen. That's what you looked at. German bodies, Canadian bodies, British bodies, everything was right there to look at amongst the pigs and the horses and the cows and everything else. That's war. That's war. That's what Khan was like. Horrible. Just completely horrible. One of the toughest battles in France was the Battle of Khan. I'll never forget it. After all they'd gone through, the men had finally captured the general's prize. From the D-Day landings to the taking of Caen, over 150,000 Allied soldiers had been killed or wounded. Having survived the Battle of Villebocage, 
John Cloudsley Thompson carried on in a new tank until he was sent home due to injury. Soon after losing his friend 36 Jones, Bill Evans was wounded in the knee. He spent the rest of the war recovering. After the bombing of Caen, Bombardier Bruce Melanson and his Bofors gun continued into France. In the next chapter of their story, the Allies thought the worst was over. None of them expected the German army would regroup, determined to push them out of Normandy at all costs. You're on edge all the time. Oh yeah, you can get killed any time, any second. It's as simple as that. Ahead, deadly snipers lay waiting in every village. When you catch one of those guys in those sights, you just gruel. And the Allies would experience one of the bloodiest battles of the entire war, the Falaise Gap. I sat on the ground and cried and was sick. I killed a human being. 